Welcome to our Covenant Theology uh, class, and I know, I, I'm sure it's been uh, informative for those of you guys who've been here. I know Hunter's a great teacher, and uh, I hope I can do even close to the justice. I have not had as much time to prepare, I'll, I'm going to be honest, it's been a crazy week. But uh, let me pray for us and we'll get started. Lord, uh, thank you. Thank you for Hunter and Marguerite. Thank you that they're getting some time away, uh, much needed with life and babies and all that. Um, thank you for uh, your word and the meaning of, of the Bible, the story of the Bible, and how important it is, and how important it is to understand that as believers in order to really lay hold of your word in ways that are meaningful for our hearts and life. And so help us to get way beyond just uh, factual information today, but um, information would actually change the way we're able to approach your word um, with joy and to know you better and to rejoice in who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, uh, how many of you would feel like you're an expert on covenant theology? Covenant? Yeah. <laughs> how many of you would say you have, uh, what about dispensational theology? Any people like, like really raised in it and feel like you really know, like Jeff, you were around it quite a bit, yeah. How many of you would, uh, well, let me ask you this question. So, how many of you have been in this class that, you know, since he's been teaching it um, and have been here consistently? Okay, so slackers rest of you but good okay so what are what are a couple of things that maybe ha- that you've learned that has stood out like like big points where you're like okay this is something i've learned so far hopefully there's something the distinction yeah. between covenant works and covenant of grace okay so, like i think i didn't i mean i you know i knew that it was like one covenant all the way through yes but i don't think i would have distinguished that the covenant of works is like completed when adam failed yes the Everything of else is, is the covenant of yeah. grace. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a dispensation, maybe? Yeah, in a way, <laughs> you could argue that, yes. But not dispensation. <clears throat> but yes, you're right. Anybody else? Good point, Vanessa. And I'd love to be able to take time and introduce everyone to one another and stuff, but time is of the essence this morning, so we're going to kind of just get into it. But uh, that's a great point. Um, Do you have notes for us, or are we just taking notes? Did... Uh, he him, does he normally have notes? He does. Okay. <laughs> Do you want me to copy or I do don't. You know? No, we don't have time. You're just going to have to. You're slumming it today, but the, the, <laughs> he'll be back next week. So we do have this that he also helped me put together. Um, so, yes, just a quick summary. Like, yeah, so he's, she just mentioned that there is a covenant of works. And it's pretty simple, actually, because there is only one law in Genesis, right? One and two. So in Genesis 1 and 2, there's one rule. What was it? Don't eat the fruit of that tree. That was the covenant of works. Will you obey me? And what's interesting is that one rule, I, I've always felt like, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's mysterious, right? It's enchanted. There's a tree of life, a tree of good and evil. Like there's this, it's like, what is that? What is the fruit of that? What, you know, we always think of it as an apple. It, it wasn't an apple. It's like, it was the... the tree of the fruit of good and evil and so like it really in a way though in my opinion and maybe i'm wrong in this but it could have been don't cross that creek don't touch that ball don't jump over it, whatever because it was the bottom line was will you submit yourself to my authority as your father will you let me be the one who is king or will you assert your authority over me as king and that really was what the covenant of works was about will you love your Lord in such a way that I am king. And of course, you know, the the temptation that came along. And ever since they fell, God had to relate to humanity on the basis of a covenant of grace if they were going to be redeemed and restored. So great point. Anything else that you learned? And then we'll get into our topic today. Did you say that there were six covenants of grace or six covenants? Like with, with Noah, with Moses, with Abraham, yeah. with Jesus. Right. Yeah, so there's been, there's been these different covenants along the way in, within the covenant of grace, right? And the first big one that comes along is with Abraham, right, which we just studied this year. And it wasn't with Adam. I'm sorry, it was Noah. And then what? Adam well, okay, yes, there's the, there's the promise that right away in Genesis 3, there's the, it's the, what they call the proto-evangelist. It's the first time that the gospel is proclaimed. It's like that in, the, the serpent will 
his head will be crushed by a, a, a son of Eve. And so I have not brushed up on that in a bit. So I don't know exactly where, but like, so there's a promise, the proto-evangelist. There's the, there's the Noahic, Noahic covenant with Noah. There's the covenant with Abraham, the covenant of Moses, the covenant with David, the covenant. So, you know, I may be missing some, but, but within all that is a covenant of, wor- of, of grace and a covenant of redemption and restoration and so forth. You get this graphic of like an apple tree, of like a seed. Yes. And then each, it's all the same. Beautiful, covenant, yes. It just looks a little bit different. In one of his sermons and or communion dialogues, he said, yeah, the covenant, we tend to think of all these as different covenants, but it's like a, it's like a sapling tree growing into this mighty oak. You know, it's like um, the one covenant just growing and growing. Thing, yeah. Basically. Organically, yes. So it's not separate, like a di- different dispensations, but like this one beautiful covenant of grace. And I, what I really want to get in today is not only the difference of covenant theology and dispensationalism, but tell you why it actually matters. Um, and so uh, let's, let's get into it. Dispensationalism. Uh, covenant theology, the story of the Bible. That's not what I need to do. <laughs> okay, there's the outline. Um, covenant for theology versus dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is a theological system of interpreting the Bible that was the first mainly espoused by a guy named John Nelson Darby. You maybe have heard of, the, of him. Uh, dispensationalism maintains that history is divided into multiple ages or dispensations in which God acts with humanity in different ways. The dispensations are innocence, um, so Adam and Eve prior to sin, consciousness or conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and kingdom. Um, So those are the different dispensations that they would kind of point to within the dispensational structure. Um, The the thing that I want to bring up to you today is this. Dispensationalism is the theological air you've breathed your entire life in the United States, pretty much. If you didn't grow up just breathing the air of dispensationalism, I'd be surprised. Uh, Some of you, if you grew up in only reform circles like Corey, I know has, uh, maybe that was not the case. Uh, Hannah also. But even even if you grew up within reform theology as your main church home environment, you would have been massively exposed to dispensationalism. So, for example, how many of you read the Left Behind series? Yeah. Uh, Utterly dispensationalism like that especially as it relates to the the view of end times within dispensationalism which is an enormous part of their theological structure can i make a comment yeah Um, when where we grew up Mm. we didn't have this differentiation until we actually came to the united states huh this is when we dispensationalism wasn't a thing it wasn't as big of a thing interesting i think you mentioned that during elder training yeah yeah it wasn't necessarily so when you got here, we were kind of like, huh, what's, what's this? Or... Well, no, not really, because it, it's very subtle, right? It okay. Comes in. You, know, you read the Left Behind series. Yeah, and, you're thinking, and it's oh. not presented as like, hey, here's one idea of interpreting this. This is like... Um... Yeah, so that's why I, I think for some of us, um, we didn't really understand that there was such a thing as dispensation. Yeah. Was, uh, and, and by the way today, the best way to explain the differences is to make extreme examples of both in a way and but the truth is over time what's happened within dispensational theology is it has it has evolved more in line with covenant theology to be honest so it's but i'm going to make hard line distinctions today in order to help us understand the differences but the reality is these are our brothers and sisters in christ these are not it's not this we're not discussing this to critique and say they're bad it's to make a distinction and hopefully point to that which we think is actually slightly more faithful to what Scripture teaches because I believe, once again, it is so helpful. And it's not to, to tear down, but to explain. Um, so if you read the, the Left Behind series, uh, how many of you, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. My parents, my stepdad got some tapes. We were going to Florida. We listened to this thing called How Lindsay's the Late Great Planet Earth. Again, end time stuff, uh, dispensationalism. How many of you grew up Baptist? Yeah, okay, again. How many of you non-denominational? Yeah. Um, have you ever read a lot of John MacArthur books or been influenced by him? Um, studied the end times. All, all of this, 
is is the milieu of dispensationalism. So, the the other thing I want us to see today is that di- dispensationalism is actually a pretty new theological construct. Um, dispensationalism is popular and widespread way of reading the Bible. It originated in the 19th century, interestingly, uh, in the teaching of John Nelson Darby, popularized in the United States through Bible conference movements. Uh, its growth was spurred on through the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible, which is a great resource. But um, it was presented, and you know, I think Reformed theology does this too. It's not like you critique everything else, but you say this is this is the facts. Uh, founding of Dallas Theological Seminary, 1924. Lewis uh, Sperry Schaefer provided an academic institution for the training of pastors and missionaries and so forth. So Ryrie, uh, Dwight Pentecost, Dallas Seminary are all sort of the underpinnings of <clears throat> this theology called dispensationalism. Can, um, I, can I make a quick comment? Absolutely. When, uh, so I, I grew up highly dispensational. You know, the organization that we work with as missionaries is highly dispensational. Which is what? New Tribes Mission, or yeah, yeah. 360. Okay. And, uh, and so that's, all my training was in that. But, and I would actually feel guilty if I questioned that, like, oh man, because I don't know, in a lot of ways it is the other side is often put down when it's taught. Yeah. Like, it can't be that. That's like almost heathen. Not quite. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, yeah. that's just kind of the flavor of the yeah. things, though it might be unspoken. And uh, this aspect here that dispensationalism is, is so new yeah. in all of history, yeah. that was the one linchpin for me. To make you go, like, hmm. it, I was okay yeah. with questioning and saying, why do I believe that? Where does that come from? Yeah. That doesn't seem that, that seems suspect to me okay. when something is that new. Yeah. Um, so now I'm ready to question it. Okay. You know, that, that is helpful. That started you know, a good number of years ago for me. So it, I'm going to go off my notes <clears throat> just a little bit uh, for a second. So the, the thing that I found, I made it all the way through seminary not basically knowing what the Bible, what the story of the Bible was. And I, and I did not go to a dispensational seminary, but I went to a a seminary based in Methodism, but we didn't. I didn't walk away with the whole paradigm of creation, fall, redemption, restoration very clearly, and and I did not understand how the Old and New Testament fit together, um, and I'm not sure m- most of the students I was with did either. Dispensationalism didn't make sense to me either because basically, and again, this is a very wooden understanding of it, but these diff- different dispensations represent in a way. We all know what happened in the fall, and everybody agrees with that. So humanity fell into sin. So how is God going to save this world from sin? And the answers from there forward are the same ultimately. It's Jesus, but how you get there is differently. So for us, covenant theology, we would say there's a covenant of works, and immediately after the covenant of works was broken by Adam, the covenant, God was not surprised. He's God. He has foreknowledge. He's sovereign. And he immediately began to institute his covenant of redemption and grace immediately. And it's unfolded through these different biblical. But you get the sense in dispensationalism in that God is trying different things to make redemption work. Um, we're going to try with Noah. It kind of works, kind of doesn't. We're going to try with Abraham. And, and it works. It's the establishment of Israel, right? Um, but then, and then it kind of works but we need governance so now we have david and the king and the kingships will somebody do this right will somebody keep the law will somebody you know and it's like different attempts at working this stuff out and then we need jesus but what's interesting is there's all these promises that have been made to israel these very clear promises what do you do with those and so when jesus comes along dispensationalism doesn't know what to do with the church in israel and there's a huge Line kind of drawn between the church and Israel, and they're different. So, for our theological system, we would say, and this is in my notes, so I'm kind of uh, stealing from my own thunder in just a second here. So I'll I'll wait, but in just a sec. Um, uh, dispensationalism is highly focused on on the end times, um, and, and you left behind all this stuff. Uh, my one of my family members is really into, into that, and it's like the only books that is are read are, are end times books, and and it's a it's a huge fascination with it. Our side of things, perhaps, 
doesn't spend uh, maybe any hardly any time and uh, but there's an over fascination with end, to end, to end times and so forth and I believe this can lead to a, pro- um, a preoccupation with matters that really can't be known and, and can be somewhat um, wasteful of our, our theological energies in some ways um, the, the next thing I want us to see and I've already kind of mentioned to it and alluded to it is dispensationalism sees this radical distinction between Israel in the church but where Pauline theology Paul really emphasizes the unity that in Christ we are the new Israel and that there isn't there really isn't a distinction between the church and Israel and that they in a sense what is happening is the church is becoming the new Israel and it's not to be anti-semitic at all but just to say that the the Lord has been working a a promise in Abraham if you remember the original Abrahamic promise was that he would bless the entire world, right? Through the, the seed of Abraham. Through, and so, as we study Genesis this year, there's this beautiful promise that the whole world, all the tribes and tongues, and are going to be blessed through Abraham. And so, and that really is the, the sending of Christ, who then would bring the gospel to the whole world. And that Israel was never meant to be contained to just one distinct... Um, race of people and tribes of people in a particular geographic region but for the whole world and so of course that raises questions well what about israel and then you know what what is what hope is there for uh people who are are jewish and then paul does seem to indicate in the book of romans that um you know that that there is hope that the hope is through christ not through being jewish the hope is through the gospel and that there will be an outpouring, Paul says in Romans, of the gospel among the Jewish people in the later days. Um, now, why does this matter? Um, it, it matters to me because if, if dispensationalism is true, in a sense, there is this sort of great divide between the Old and New Testament. And you see this being worked out even in some, some really well-known pastors are beginning to say things like this, like... Uh, Andy Stanley, uh, who's had a huge influence on the American church, has recently said we can largely ignore the Old Testament, which is really fascinating and, and sad. <laughs> um, and it's, I think it's like dispensationalism run to its ultimate problem if you're not careful. Um, he's saying, gosh, we have all this trouble and problem. The Old Testament seems it's, it's unclear. How do we deal with it? There's all this... this uh, law and all these rules and all this difficulty and like what do we do with all that and he's basically saying in a way yeah we can largely ignore that that was law it's all been fulfilled in jesus we can put that away and there's a truth in that in jesus christ the law has been fully and finally um fulfilled but that doesn't mean that that entire you know like four thousand years of, of history that god gave us is now done away with what's interesting is one of the reasons One of his primary things that he's appealing to is that we need to really focus on image bearing and loving people well because they're image bearers of God. And where do you get that idea? The Old Testament. (laughs) The Old Testament, Genesis 1 and 2. So you can't get rid of the Old Testament. and, and, And so anyway, the problem is, why does this matter? Because until covenant theology, in my opinion, helps us understand the entire how how the story of God is one unfolding story and that there's unity between the Old and the New Testament. So I, I've been waxing a little bit. Michael Heiser, um, who's an Old Testament theologian and ancient Near East, all, he's, he's, I don't need to give a history of it, but anyway, he explains the difference by saying, um, you know, the, the difference in understanding, especially with eschatology, is you're either a joiner or a splitter mm. in, in how you interpret things. Mm. You see it if you're a splitter, uh, i.e. dispensational, uh, you're going to see differences and you're going to chop it up and say, okay, that's over there. And and the ultimate outworking of that is kind of what you're hearing with Andy Stanley. It's saying, oh, Old Testament, mm, doesn't really, we don't really yeah. need to pay too much attention to it where a joiner sees the cohesiveness of the whole story okay. um, and says, no, this all flows together, it fits, um, everything is important for us, and this is how it, it sticks together. That's, yeah. that's helpful. Thank you, Jeffrey. 
So I'm going to share with you my little chart that I use, and it's way oversimplified, but it's kind of like as I try to explain covenant theology and why I'm so excited about it. In fact, to be honest, like what makes Reformed theology beautiful to me is not the five points of Calvinism, even though I, I agree with the five points of Calvinism, and I think they're great, and I'm in Intro to New Valley, I go over all that. But like it, it really is it's covenant theology, which is what I get most excited about, which is, is biblical theology, which is... Um, you know, a, a timeline in a sense where if, if Christ is at the center of it all, and, and we believe that, right, there's there's creation, there's uh, fall, and then after that, what, what happens? And it, the entire Old Testament, we believe, is a foreshadowing or a pointing to the coming of Christ and the fulfillment of all of these promises, whether it's Abraham, Noah, etc., etc., that ultimately... Jesus is the greater, David the greater, Noah the greater, Abraham, he's, he is the, the ram caught in the thicket, he's the Passover lamb, he is the, he's the whole reason, right? He's the hero of the entire story. And so the, the entire Old Testament, and this isn't entirely fair, because it's not like every single passage is pointing to Jesus, but in, in, broad, in a broad way, every single story, everything, everything is ultimately pointing us to Jesus, including like the Levitical law, which is you look at it and you say, who can keep all of that? And it's so intense and so ridiculous. Well, it shows the depth of depravity and sin and how unclean we are, but how in Jesus we really have been made clean, that he is the, he is the ultimate um, savior that we needed. So the entire Old Testament, in a sense, is pointing us forward to Jesus. And of course, in the New Testament, it's pointing us back to Jesus and then pointing us forward to Jesus as well, that it's all about Christ. And where, where, I, where I would get confused in studying dispensationalism, it really did kind of feel like God is trying to work out salvation in these different dispensationalists and then not really accomplishing it, getting to Jesus and then dividing the church and Israel. And that's where it gets problematic for me and makes people really confused with how uh, the Old and the New Testament relate to one another. Questions? Vanessa? It almost sounds like way that you described it, like um, the dispensational, like God being kind of weak and, you know, unable to kind of figure out what's yeah. really going on here, like he's kind of confused. So and I don't confused. think that's what they teach or believe, but I think it's it's a bit implied, like, maybe. Oh, I wish I could have made that work out. Let's try it again. Well, because in most dispensational <coughs> circles are not coming from a more, um, it's coming more from our free will vantage point they would emphasize free will over God's sovereignty. And so in light of that, yes, it can be like God's attempting, but God can't make us, he's not going to control us. It's our free will. So we keep blowing it. God's faithful. They wouldn't say God is impotent or unable. Instead, he, they would say, you know, that he is, he's doing what he can do, but we have free will. He's li- but it almost sounds limited. Limited by our free will. Yeah, by our- I mean, ultimately, that's what Arminianism comes down to. If you... And then they would say, yeah, but you're illogical because you say we have human responsibility and freedom, and yet God is utterly and completely sovereign. So we're all, ultimately, we have some conundrums, right? So, so they kind of see us maybe like more robotic because we're just following They would God say, is- right, obviously, that, yeah, that Reformed theology would seem like, yeah, we none of this matters. God's just doing what God wants to do. So they both have their tension, but um, yes, I'll leave it there. Yeah, one of the, I think one of the uh, proof texts that is used is at 1 Corinthians 10.32 where Paul talks about the church, okay. the Jews, and the Gentiles. Mm. And that's the emphasis that dispensational. Yeah. Yeah. Y- and it's not as if language is, isn't used, like that isn't used. It clearly is used. But what ultimately Paul, how does Paul resolve that? He makes the distinctions at, at some places, but in the other places he's saying there's no distinction between you. Like the Ephesians talks about how the dividing wall has been destroyed, but he still does make the distinction. He'll even like in the same letter, and he's not trying to create a dispensational framework. What he's trying to say is like, you Jews hate the Gentiles. You Gentiles hate the Jews. The dividing wall has been torn in two. You're now one people. You're one new people. He makes that so clear in Ephesians. And so quick fighting but then he'll go back to the the gentiles and say 
you Gentile pagans, you know. But he's not trying to make a distinction between the church and Israel or the church. You know, it's like, a, it's not like, and if anything, he's utterly destroying that saying. The dividing wall has been utterly, you are one new humanity. Um, Paul understands, too, that the Jews have a very different background and a worldview to yeah. speak into where the Yeah, <clears throat> they have this whole biblical framework of the entire Israelites. So he keeps appealing to them, like, uh, now walk in this into the Gentile. He's saying, uh, don't submit yourselves to the law. So he has specific messages to each group of people, but and ultimately what he's saying is, but you are one new humanity in Christ. Um, Corey? Yeah, I think, I mean, as you read the Old Testament, I think something that's been really helpful is, I mean, with this idea and the timeline, is just, I mean, all the foreshadowing. Yeah. All the stories. It's beautiful, right? All of God revealing himself, saying these things about who he is, yet without Christ, like without a full picture, during this time, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, even back to the question, why did sin have to enter the world too, which is a huge one as well. But God is not able to reveal to humanity who he is without sin entering the world. So mm. he could tell us he's gracious and merciful, as he does in the Old Testament, mm. but that's not demonstrated until no. Christ comes. And yeah. I think, you know, if we say that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy mm. him forever, yeah. that's the only way. To you're going deep, man. You're going philosophical deep. It is to understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, like, do we, yeah. And he shows us that. Until you know that. Sure. Yeah. It's well said. You know, uh, the Bible does, does talk about the different dispensations, right? Epic. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, New covenant, old covenant. Yeah. Uh, and in in Genesis, um, God talks about, you know, he, he's done with, he mentions, he doesn't say it's done, but he mentions creation. Mm -hmm. um, and it is good, right? And he's done with create, creating the world. Um, but then through all of these dispensations, was n nothing was said about it is finished or it's completed mm. until we got to mm. the cross. Yeah. Right? And then yeah. Jesus and then God said it is finished. Yeah. It's done. Um, so there was no indication, I mean, the way I look at it too is that there's no indication through all these epics that uh, God was done, mm. was done with us. Yeah. Until Je and Jesus is the Jesus. fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah, very good. I think there's the teaching, isn't there, uh, with this dispensational that says that Jesus offered Israel the kingdom and they they refused it. Yeah. And then, but that's not the teaching of uh, of uh, covenant theology. Right. right. Yes, that's right. And here, the problem with this is, you guys, covenant theology and dispensational theology. It, it's uh, five weeks is not going to cut it. You know what I'm saying? Like five weeks doesn't cut, cut you know, discussing uh, covenant theology. One, one week of, we're talking, we're talking a lot of it. There's just no way to cut it. So this is a very, very shallow uh, attempt at, at like getting into this. But it's, it's still important nonetheless and, and help you kind of understand where we're coming from uh, in terms of our theological framework. Um, so here's sort of a side-by-side -side parallel of like how we view things and, and how dispensationalism would, would view things. So like God's people in covenant theology. God, in covenant theology, God has one people represented by the saints in the Old Testament and the saints in the New Testament era, and that ultimately salvation is through Jesus Christ. So that in the Old Testament, saints, believe it or not, they were saved by the atoning work of Christ in his life, death, and resurrection. That's how powerful the resurrection was how was moses saved not by his obedience to the law by jesus's obedience to the law and by his death resurrection and, and so god's people in dispensationalism again forgive the wooden nature of this but god has one people represented by the saints in the old testament um, and the saints of the new testament era so it's it's diff it's a different group of people so it's like you have um and i think maybe that was typed up improperly because yeah. mm, it is the same it's the same so let's let's look at it here <laughs> And uh, by the way, um, Hunter made that slide, so. <laughs> 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 
it's God has two separate peoples, Israel and the church, and also has two separate plans for those two distinct peoples. Right. Right. He plans an, an earthly kingdom for Israel. Right. Uh, this kingdom has been postponed until Christ's coming in power since Israel rejected it at Christ's first coming. Right. During the church age, God is calling out a heavenly people. Right. Uh, thus the rapture and the, you know, that kind of thing. Um, dispensationalists disagree over whether the two peoples will remain distinct in the eternal state. They disagree. <laughs> According to yeah. So next would be a discussion of um, God's plan of salvation in covenant theology versus dispensational theology. Um, in 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 covenant theology, God has one. Well, yeah, okay. Um, God has one people, um, has one plan. Okay. That's what you just read. Yeah, yeah all right. God has a plan. Okay, yeah, I haven't moved on yet. Here we go. God has one plan of salvation for his people since the time of Adam. The plan is one of grace, being an outworking of the eternal covenant of grace and comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, the plan of salvation, dispensational theology. God has one plan of salvation, though this often has been misunderstood because of um, inexactness in some dispensational writings. Um, some have wrongly taught or understood that the Old Testament believers were saved by works and sacrifices. However, most have believed that salvation has always been by grace through faith alone, but the content of that faith may vary until the full re revelation of Christ. I have heard it both ways uh, from dispensational teachers, yeah, that some would emphasize that they were saved by their covenant keeping and their works of the law and, and the Old Testament kind of era. But this is where we're seeing things evolve in the right direction where like really the two systems are agreeing more than disagreeing in, in this regard um, the next um, thing is eternal destiny for God's people in covenant theology versus dispensational um, God has one place for his people since he has but one people one plan for his people and one plan of salvation his people will be in his presence for eternity and in the when he redeems and restores all things, the new heavens and the new earth, um, which is our glorious hope, right? Eternal destiny for God's people in dispensational theology. There's disagreement among dispensationalists regarding the future states of Israel and the church. Many believe that the church will sit with Christ in his throne in the new Jerusalem during the millennium as he rules over the nations while Israel will be the head of the nations of the earth during the millennium. Um, I, I have to admit, you guys, on the end time stuff, I am extremely in the dark in understanding dispensational theology. I understand my own theology because it's so simple, <laughs> uh, which is a more odd mill position. But the, the premillennial dispensational um, end times views is so complex that I really, I really do have a hard time understanding everything that is, is going on there. And I've studied it intensely at different times of my life, but then... There's so much detail that it's hard to remember it all. Jeff? One of the things that always kind of stuck in my craw, as it were, especially as, as I was learning uh, in the dispensational framework mm -hmm. and time stuff was, it just seemed like, well, how many times is Jesus coming back? Right. It's, it's, There's a lot of coming it back. It almost has to be <laughs> at least three times, and I've heard it was seven or something <laughs> crazy like that. Maybe five. I, I can't remember what the numbers were, but... Yeah. <clears throat> yes. That's right. So... Um, the birth of the church in covenant theology. Um, the church existed prior to the New Testament era, including all the redeemed since Adam. Pentecost was not the beginning of the church, but rather the empowering of the New Testament manifestation of God's people with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? That, that was unique at Pentecost, though. At that point, the Spirit would reside upon uh, certain saints, like David, for example, was filled with God's Spirit. But it seemed to be more for an anointing for a specific purpose for a specific moment. But like... As you know, at Pentecost in the book of Acts, the Spirit was poured out on all believers and empowering all believers. Um, and then, of course, all true believers speak in tongues after that. Just kidding. Okay. Uh, I've never heard that the church was born on the day, like, for the dispensational, and the church 
is not found in the Old Testament, and saints are not part of the body of Christ. What's what saints? The church was born, the birth of the church in dispensational time. The church was born on the day of Pentecost and did not exist in history until that time. That much, I believe, is, is true. The church, the body of Christ, is not found in the Old Testament also, and saints are not a part of the body of Christ. That last phrase, I would not put much stock in. Saints referring to Old Testament. Old Testament saints, yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right, all right, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Context, mm-hmm. I'd be curious how they could, you know, see Hebrews 11, where it lists yeah. out all the saints and you see this continuity. And like how they would... the reason why I'm, I am using this, this, this stuff I'm doing, the side-by-side comparisons coming from a guy named Richard Belcher from monergism.com. Um, a study of, uh, he's a covenant theologian, but I got this from online, so that's why I'm, I'm not certain about all the details here. Uh, they, so they would say they're not believers? No, they, they would say they're believers. They're just saying that they are, there's a distinction between Israel and the church, right? So they would not be members of the church. And so the big, the big picture, don't, don't get caught up in the weeds. It's more, there's a distinction between the Israel and the church. And, and that's, to us, we feel is confusing and, and somewhat problematic. Um, the, the purpose of Christ's first coming in covenant the, uh, theology, Christ came to die for our sins and to establish a new Israel, the New Testament manifestation of the church. This continuation of God's plan placed the church under a new manifestation of the same covenant of grace. Again, the organic growth of this covenant, right? The kingdom that Jesus offered was the present spiritual and invisible kingdom. Some covenantalists, especially post millennials, also see a physical aspect of this kingdom. Ooh, I don't know how deep I want to get into that, but that, that is another eschatological view, the post millennial view. So we. Like we're bringing the kingdom right now, right? Yeah, so you'll see a lot of extremism in post millennial views. Uh, so, for example, there's a church here in town called. Uh, let's face the name of it. Apologia. They're very, very post-millennial. They believe that the Old Testament law should be fully applied now so that someone who gets an abortion should be stoned to death. They would say that's not going to happen, but it should, and that there should be a, there should be a law keeping of God's people now, of the Old Testament law, that we usher in a theonomy, a new, a new movement of the kingdom of God here on earth in such a way that we basically take over the world for the, for the sake of Christ. Where we would say the kingdom of God is uh, it's a spiritual kingdom, and we have keys to the kingdom, and the gospel is the keys to that kingdom, and that we're seeing a new humanity created in Christ, and that he has fulfilled the law, and we, we love the Old Testament law, especially the moral law in the Old Testament of the Ten Commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and so forth. But, um, yeah... That's that's getting into some ways. Uh, purpose of Christ's first coming in this one, sectional theology. Christ came to establish the messianic kingdom. Uh, some believe that this was to be an earthly kingdom in the fulfillment of the Old Testament to Israel. If the Jews had accepted Jesus' offer, this is where it kind of gets in this. We're, we're giving this a try. Um, this earthly kingdom would have been established immediately. Other dispensationalists believe that Christ did establish the kingdom in some form in which the church participates, but the earthly kingdom awaits the second coming of Christ to the earth. Christ always intended the cross before the crown. When it says there that if the Jews had accepted Jesus' offer, like, is that implying... He came as... So Jesus was the messianic expectation... He didn't match their expectation, but he was the fulfillment of the messianic promise, right? So that, you know, and, and let's face it, that they, they, this confusion exists for some reason because God made specific promises to a very specific group of people, Israel. He didn't make them to Assyria, and he didn't make them to Babylon. He made them to the, to the Israelites. But sometimes we forget that all those promises, like all those promises were meant to be a blessing to the whole world that came to Abraham. And so... When you fail to remember that and you feel like these are just wooden promises to Israel and not the whole world, then it gets kind of confusing. And they say, well, like Jesus was the Messiah for the Jews. They rejected him. And so then and Jesus even says a few things like, you know, to the to the woman that pleads with him about, you know, and he says, you know, uh, 
basically calls her a dog. Like, and he didn't really mean that, but you know, and then saying, I came for the Jewish people in a sense. And there's a truth in that. He did, but beyond that, the messy, you know, the, he's the Messiah for the whole world. But there, they have this view that if, yes, had Israel accepted Jesus fully as Messiah, God would have been like, done deal. Like, we did it. When he cried over Jerusalem, remember? Yes. They said, yes. and you would not. Yes, and, and they did it. And, and, you know, his own rejected him and so forth. And, and they but did. But still the sin problem. There's still, so but, yeah, it's like because problem. once again, it's, it's an over earthly expectation in a sense. Uh, and that was their big problem in a sense as well, that he had to go to the cross, right? The Jews didn't crucify Jesus ultimately, and neither did the Romans. It was God the Father put him on the, Jesus himself put himself on the cross in order to die. It wasn't a mistake. Like, whoops, that Messiah blew it, and the whole mission was the cross and the resurrection. And his life. <laughs> but just back to the example of the other church, too, like you see the other side of the danger of moving away from Christ, Christ plus, or Christ. Yeah. And, and you know, if you're, if you're willing to take that step and move that now that it's been done for me, I can accomplish perfection or I can eradicate sin problems. Like, that's just it. in this cycle of destruction. Mm-hmm. Those people to, I mean, either a continual denying of what's actually going on inside their own hearts and lives, um, you know, or, or yeah. Like, and so, I mean, that's something that you over and over again, right? Like, on both sides, like the greater the problem is, the the more we see them. Yeah. So we have a lot of friend, uh, family that are Baptist. Becky and I do, and one of her brother-in-laws, who's a dear brother in Christ, and like has great theology. But when we argue this stuff, and we agree on. 99 point percent but the one in his dispensationalism he would say there were all these very specific promises to israel like and it's like yes but they're fulfilled in jesus and he would just say no they're they really were for israel and they're going to be fulfilled later during the millennium and then you know that kind of thing so uh i'm gonna have to kind of pick and choose some of the ones we discuss here um the fulfillment of the the new covenant um the promises of the new covenant mentioned in Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, etc. Um, <laughs> hang on, I'm going to read it over here. Uh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers. Man, this isn't, this isn't very helpful. Let's move on. <laughs> Okay, how the second coming is viewed in covenant theology. This will be more interesting. Um, Okay. Christ's coming will uh, be to bring final judgment in the eternal state. (coughs) Those who are premillennial assert that a millennial period will will precede the judgmental and eternal state, and postmillennialists believe that the kingdom is being established by the work of God's people on earth right now until the time when Christ will bring it to completion as coming. This is a little confusing, okay? Within covenant theology, there's three different views of the end times. Dispensationalism, there's one view. In, in covenant theology, there's amillennialism. I'll try to give a brief explanation of that in just a second. There is, there is non-dispensational premillennialism. Called historic. That's it. Yeah, historic <coughs> pre-mill and then post-mill. I think postmillennialism has the most problems. Uh, does that mean we're done? <laughs> okay. I I take what's called the ah mill position. Um, the pre mill position, I think, is there's some similarities between the ah mill position, but it has some problems I've already mentioned. And the historic pre mill uh, is also um, I, I find harder to understand, but at the same time, I think has some good things going for it. I think they're all somewhat valid and they all have their strengths and weaknesses the thing that i like the most about the ah mill position is and some people say it's wimpy but i think it sticks to what is most clear um uh and it's it's this is what we know for sure jesus is going to return we don't know the day or the hour and that when he returns there will be a judgment of all people 
And we believe, I personally believe, that when Christ returns, there is no secret rapture. There is no, there is no other millennial period that then he will come back down. Like, he came, came once. He rose. He's coming halfway again. Down, he'll be halfway down. There'll be a rapture. <laughs> then, and then he'll come back a thousand years later and finally bound Satan and all these things. That when Christ returns, he will, he will return victoriously. The dead in Christ will rise and the judgment will begin. And then the kingdom of God will be established uh, in the universe, in the, the you know, new heavens, new earth. That, because that is like the clearest of what we know. It may work its way out in a lot of different ways. If, if it could be a rapture, it could be a, a millennial kingdom here on you. But those things are so symbolic in the book of Revelation and Daniel and things like They're very, very hard to know. So what I like about this position, the Amil position, it sounds negative, Amil. It's basically saying we are in the millennium. And, and we are in the tribulation and that we have been in this state since Christ came, that Christ came. He established his kingdom in a sense. And in another way, he has not. It's the already, but the not yet. When Christ came, he said, I've come, you know, I, you see his kingdom in fruition when, with his physical presence very clearly. But it, it's the already here and not yet here because he hasn't he hasn't returned. Um, and so, in a sense, since Christ rose from the dead, we're living in this tension, waiting for his return. Uh, One pastor yeah. said, I believe in pan-millennialism. Yeah. It's all going to pan out. It, it's, <laughs> and he said, whatever way Christ does it, I'm going with him. Amen. And that's, that's, that is what I'm for. <laughs> also, let's move on. Um, we could have we we would need ten weeks to go establish like what is all mill what is pre mill uh, historic pre mill all these it would take a long time uh, most dispensationalists do believe the rapture will occur first then a tribulation period followed by the second coming of Christ with the saints and a thousand year reign of Christ over which there will be a judgment in the eternal state does that seem right that's right. Not, you forgot to mention the war that happens after the thousand years where somehow evil comes back in. So this is where, yeah, it can be confusing. You're going to have to help me out here because I, I really don't understand all of it. But like there is a, a rapture. We all know what that is. Left behind, right? Uh, you got airline pilots flying along and all of a sudden they're gone, right? Because the rapture happened. They're like, people just disappear. What happened? Well, Christ came down but not fully, came close enough that all true believers are sucked up. There's a rapture. Then there will be a tribulation period. Seven years. Seven year tribulation, followed by a second coming of Christ again with a thousand year reign of Christ for those people that were redeemed during the tribulation, right? Yes. Yeah. So like those of us that right are there. saved now will already be with Jesus hanging out during this whole time. We're then there's this chance. tribulation <laughs> and, and so forth. There's another chance. So all these people are going to get, get saved and hang out with Jesus for a thousand years. But somehow then Satan gets unbound again and then there's this, right? Yeah. A great war again and then th then it all comes down. Yeah. And it's a classic example, this thousand year uh, issue is a classic example of the joiner versus splitter. Okay. Um, the splitter sees a thousand years as that has to be its own thing. Right. Instead of seeing, hey, maybe, maybe in that one place yeah. in the whole Bible where that's mentioned, Yes. Maybe it's not supposed to be a literal thing of representation and it fits with everything else. They split it and make it its own thing where a joiner says, hey, this, this is cohesive with these other... That's really helpful. And what's interesting, this is, just, this is a great hermeneutic for, for all of us as we study the Bible. Never take a minor thing in Scripture, like where it's only mentioned once, and, make, and establish an entire theology of it. The prayer of Jabez is a perfect example. Like, like this very, very small thing that's mentioned, and you make a lot of money out of it. An unbelievably small idea. Like, wow, that's a small example. The millennium can be that way. Uh, and and another, another really important thing is when you're dealing with eschatological language, when you're dealing with any text of any text, whether it's the Bible or not, you really need to ask what kind of what is the author meaning to say here? And what kind of language are they using? Is, it, is this historical narrative? Is this poetry? Is it imagery? Is it, in an eschatological language, it is so symbolic, especially back then. There were numeric values, like even getting into like the, the number of the beast and that kind of thing. A lot of that was meant to be metaphorical. And the thousand year reign is like a perfect number. It could mean 
it, in my opinion, it was not meant to be a, a literal thousand millennial, you know, year um, thing. So, anyway, it, it is interesting too um, how the problem with the end, end time fascinations is you start reading in because we're we're trying to figure out when he's coming back. That that's the heart of it, and and that is a good heart. I think in covenant theology, if we're if we're not careful. We can be like, it's all, it's all going to go down. He's coming back. I mean, who cares? Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's coming. But we don't give him much thought. Our other friends and family on that side, I think, get too preoccupied with it. And in that preoccupation, if you're not careful, you're like, when, when, when? And you start reading things into Scripture all the time. My own mom, who I hope will not be listening to this, she probably, I don't think she'll be able to figure it out, said to me the other day, well, you know, America's going to hell in a hymn. I know, I know, it is, it is. But like, it's like, but, and we're not even mentioned in the Bible in the end times. I'm like, no, we're not. And, and neither is Great Britain, and neither is Russia, and neither is anybody that lives today. It's just not even talked about. But, you know, but instead, you, you know, you grow up like great planet Earth. It's like, well, this means Russia, and this means tanks, and this means helicopters, and this means, and it's like, I don't think so. I really don't think so. And the United States is not mentioned because the only place that's mentioned is the Book of Mormon, and we all know that's true. And so it's like, you know, it's like, so it's just that we're not in there, but that's okay because none of the modern countries are. That's not what's discussed. It's, uh, that's just not the context. <laughs> I kind of have a big picture question. So, like, I like big picture. Um, <laughs> so, if dispensationalism is relatively new yeah. and covenant theology was around, I imagine there was another theology that countered the covenant theology before dispensationalism. Like, what, what <laughs> was the vacuum question. that created a space for dispensationalism? In wow, the, that is a great question. <laughs> Or was it just like, it because like when I, when I was studying the Bible growing up, I grew up under kind of the covenant theology, yeah. but then I would read the Bible on my own. Yeah. And I could see if you were kind of reading the Bible in isolation where you would get this dispensational view because okay. it's so literal. It's so like, but why, why did we get away from a more metaphorical understanding of some of these Be, things? In a, in a way, it's, it's a good response. In another way, it's a, it's a bad response. The good response, you know... <laughs> You know, Ken can help me with this. There, there was a big debate a couple hundred, 150 years ago in America about fundamentalism versus like liberal theology that was growing, that kind of thing. And, and fundamentalism, the best sense of that word, meaning like people want to stick to the fundamentals. This is before fundamentalism, right? And in saying we need a more, we want to take the Bible seriously. And in doing that, that's that's a beautiful thing. That's what you should do. Some, the problem with fundamentalism though is it it doesn't have room for things like metaphor or that it wants to see the entire Bible as only one type of literature, which is just not true. And it's still fully authoritative. Like the Psalms are po poems, but they're just as authoritative as, as Romans, you know, which is, we know what kind of literature that is. That is a, that is a letter that Paul wrote. That is a, you know, an epistle of an apostle. But like, I think it is a reaction of, of, fundam of a fundamentalistic spirit in a way, and also a reaction all the way back from the Reformation, which is a good thing, which is let's get the scripture in the hands of the people in their own language. But then in a way, let's face it, it's complex. And so how do you break it down? And the more, <laughs> I think it led to some of the confusion. So the, the positive is we have the Bible in our own language and everybody's reading it. But then you could have but some people with, The first time I read the Bible, I walked away utterly confused. You know, there's, so. there's no Bibles in Catholic Mass. There's, <laughs> right? well, there's Bibles, but nobody to interpret and tell you. No, like, no, no, you can get a Bible. Like, the one Bible was up on, on, uh, at the right. altar, right, and from the priest. But you got a missile, and there was this excerpt that they told you. But, yeah, so you had to, like, but having people Bibles in people's hands didn't Right. Have so, yeah. But, uh, honestly, I don't. Okay. I, think the I haven't done enough. That is a great question. Okay. That I don't fully in. Yeah. Jeff has the answer. I, I do. I, okay, I Jeff has the answer. Let's go. Right. On this. Um, maybe to the point of being overly dogmatic, but I, I would. Uh, we're so far removed from the original context of what was communicated in Scripture and the language and the culture, and we don't have the Scripture in our language as clearly as it was in the ancient Hebrew and the Koine Greek. 
what we have are a representation of that, which is not very clear, which is why you read the Bible and it's like, ah, what the heck? Um, so the fact that we have an unclear message can lead to maybe kind of pulling away from it and then that vacuum yeah. of fundamentalism, hey, we need to follow this to the T, and then how did they fill that? With literal interpretation of it instead of saying, hey, what's the genre like you talked about? What kind of text is this? Hey, this is a letter. Somebody's arguing something here. Or in Revelation, this is an apocalyptic and a letter. And how is apocalyptic language to be understood? It has highly metaphorical. The numbers have, you know, meanings that are not oftentimes yes. not literal. Yeah. But yes, and, remember what Peter Peter read, said that Paul wrote some things that are hard to understand. Yeah. He yeah. Said. yeah. So even in that day, yeah. You know, so, Can you give us a brief on your understanding of how, in your 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 progress, you came out of hmm. Asbury Seminary. How yeah. did you get to where you are? <laughs> oh boy. <Yeah. laughs> we're done. We're done. We. Let me say this. Like so, I I was ex- my first church experience, like many of you, was all dispensational. But I I wasn't a believer yet. You know, I was like being taken to church, and. And it, my pastor was from Dallas Seminary, faithful Bible preacher, called people to faith constantly. Like it was a, it was a good church. And he was a faithful guy. But so I was a, a, my first exposure was all dispensational, but just confusion, and I wasn't a believer yet. Then I became a Christian in a Methodist context. And, and my story of how I became into Reformed theology is probably too long to tell today. But, um, you know, I'd say this, but what it was was like seminary did not give me the answers. It gave me tools to, like, start a lifelong journey of study and so this class is not going to give you the answers but it's going to give you a couple little tools for you to keep your study going and and maybe some ways in which now you can progress a little little more in your understanding of the scripture like um and i do think it's important like i do think like on the on the one hand we should have reacted against the catholic idea that like the bible stays up here but on the other hand there's a it's important to study with people who know something we don't know. And so I began to just, I started studying theology after seminary. And that's what took me on my journey to, to I think, a greater, of where I am today, whether I'm fully right or not. I don't think I'm fully right, but like, it's taken me on this long, lifelong journey. Yeah. It was kind of to develop Calvinism. Yeah, I started out <laughs> trying to get my Calvinistic friends not to be Calvinist. And then. Get them off your back. And yeah, and get, get them off my back and tell them why they're wrong. And then I got converted. <laughs> okay, let me close in prayer in just a sec. But uh, I think we just need to rearrange these tables, right? And oh yeah, of course. But I mean, you talk about tension a lot. Right? Yeah, to me, this is another big example of attention. And there's a lot of tensions in reform circles between pursuing depth and the truth because that's going to lead mm. to pride. Right, like mm-hmm. I've got the answers, and I'm good. Where this hunger, this continued search for knowledge, should lead us to love our neighbor, yes, and others, love God, yeah, better. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, just be checking <laughs> those things in the tension yes. as pursuit, because I think, yes, I think sadly there's a rejection. Oh, like, I'm just not gonna go deep. I'm not gonna dive yes. in and go because I I see that I see that in reform circles, and I don't I don't want to be a part of it. Yeah. people that have the truth that have it all figured out but are cold can't yeah exactly there's all this tension and that's a great that's a great way to say it yeah so i feel like it'll be good that hunter is back next week and i appreciate your guys patience let me pray lord thank you for our time together and uh thank you for this chance to go a little deeper in in covenant theology and dispensational theology but none of this matters if it doesn't lead us to love you more and love who you are more and what you're doing in the world and and the hope that we have in you. So um, I just pray that, yeah, some doors will be open in our hearts and minds to, to love you more today. In Jesus' name, amen.